Welcome to the Catapult Lockdown Virtual Salon Program. This afternoon, I'll be in discussion with Stephanie Leach from Trinidad and Tobago. Before we begin, I'd like to express huge thanks to the Catapult partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative and Fresh Milk for making this series of salons happen. Please feel free to ask your questions in the comments section during the talk, which will get to the Q&A segment of the salon and subscribe to the Fresh Milk YouTube channel. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raquel Payawonski. I am a visual artist from the Dominican Republic, where I also live and work. Um, today, I am very pleased to be speaking with Stephanie Leach um, from Trinidad and Tobago. Stephanie Leach is a fierce feminist organizer, LGBTQ plus advocate and nonprofit leader from Trinidad and Tobago. In 2011, she founded the digital platform Womantra, which remains the premier hub for Caribbean and diaspora social justice activist and cyber feminist advocacy. In 2015, Stephanie successfully transitioned the popular vi virtual space into a registered nonprofit and has headed the organization for the past five years. Her activism largely focuses on sexual and gender bias, violence, reproductive health rights, social policy, and young um, feminist mentorship. Having worked within the Caribbean context over the past decade, Stephanie brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to the landscape of women's rights and movement building grounded in the realities of a diverse region. Welcome, Stephanie. Super happy to have you here today. Hi, Raquel. It's so How are good you? to see you again. Very nice <laughs> to well. see you again and be able to have yes. this chat. Um, I would love to know a lot more about what we started off speaking and a little bit more about one mantra if you want to share um, the process of how it came about. Sure. This is a story that I, um, I have to tell a lot, <laughs> but um, I actually like telling this story because, well, I think it's interesting and it's also um, deeply personal. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a close uh, colleague and friend, uh, Michelle Isava, who is a local performance artist. And many years ago, she did a performance called Womantra, um, where she was dressed all in white and was drawing seven concentric circles around herself. Um, and there was a loudspeaker um, blaring, the whole is whole. <laughs> And um, this performance really resonated um, with me, um, you know, kind of speaking to the divine feminine, but also just the wholeness of femininity and womanhood. And this, you know, resonated with me so much so that, um, you know, I think it was over a year later, um, I decided to have a centennial celebration for International Women's Day. Uh, which was a really kind of quaint gathering um, of younger and older feminists, you know, sharing poetry, music, even tantric belly dancing. <laughs> and um, I named it Womantra. And I remember actually drawing Womantra with sidewalk chalk onto the pavement so that people could find this event, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and following that event, because everybody had such a good time, we were all like, oh, we should keep in touch. We should do this again. Um, and at that time, which was in 2011, um, Facebook was becoming a thing, you know, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that, that everybody was on. And so I was like, okay, great. I'll, I'll form a group. We can share pictures. We can stay in touch. And from there, it just grew and grew. Um, I started to add other um, Caribbean feminists that I started to meet through various trainings and meetings in the region. And um, yeah, the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> That's wonderful. But you started as a cyberspace and it became very solid, very well known in the region. And somehow you transitioned into something else in the more recent years. How did that happen? 
Well, um, in 2014, I had the opportunity to study abroad in Portugal. And um, I was just really nervous, actually, that Womantra would die <laughs> uh, with me being out of the country. And I just thought now is the time to kind of formalize the collective um, and figure out leadership, you know, who can run um, run things when I'm gone. Um, that's when I, I registered Womantra as a nonprofit organization. And that came um, just after we had done our first programmatic activity, which was a mentorship program for girls. So we had actually already started to move um, out of the cyber world and into quote unquote real life. Um, so we were, you know, kind of already starting to do organizational work. Mm -hmm. And how does your, how does the community in, in Trinidad and Tobago respond to LGBTQ plus community and the work being done by yourself or Mantra and other organized feminist organizations in general? How, how is the cultural, is there a backlash? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, actually, Womantra, there are a few things that we um, are most remembered and known for. <laughs> and one of them was um, a campaign actually called In Solidarity with Shannon. Um, Shannon Gomes was a young woman who was attempting to um, go to a club um, called Aria Nightclub in Trinidad. And um, it was like a ladies free night, which we know is kind of common um, because, you know, the club owners want women in their club. And she was wearing a shirt and pants and like, quote unquote, male dress shoes. And um, the club bouncer basically told her that she wasn't allowed to come in for free because she was um, dressed like a man. <laughs> and I, I became aware of this um, on Facebook. Someone just posted it um, with, a, with an image of like supermodels <laughs> dressed in what you would consider stereotypically male clothes um, and looking sexy and basically just making fun of how ridiculous the whole situation was. And um, I just became really enraged, just me on my own. <laughs> mm -hmm. I decided I have to do something about this. And so I, you know, put out a public call for, you know, all women to come dressed as men <laughs> in front of Aria um, and have a, a protest or solid solidarity action. And um, to my surprise, um, more than I think 30 women showed up um, and, I think I didn't realize how important that was at the time because I think this was one of the first, um, you know, public actions um, that really centered um, lesbian women um, and specifically the kind of discrimination that women face, even if you're not lesbian, you know, just mm -hmm. around gender identity and all of that. And the media really picked up on this um, and it became a thing, you know, I was doing interviews and all of that specifically talking about um, gender identity and about transphobia and all of these things um, that were being attached to Shannon's body. And I think that it was really a kind of turning point where you know we were talking about these things um, on a national scale because of course conversations were happening around sexual orientation, um, but you know those discourses tend to be very male-centered etc or policy centered but this was just about you know regular discrimination like going to a club <laughs> and people kind that kind of resonated with people particularly because there's been um similar pushback um against clubs in trinidad around race so i mm -hmm. think people um, connected with it in a in a particular kind of way i find it very interesting also that i read a comment you made about how all mantra has really contributed to sort of normalizing feminism and activism and advocacy in, in Trinidad, which is really a, an, an incredible and a huge job. Yeah. So good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it definitely comes with a lot of pushback, I know. a lot of backlash. Of course. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the phrases of the day, um, 
yeah, in Trinidad is where's Womandra? So um, people are always asking that question um, online, you know, whenever there's any type of event that they think um, a feminist organization should be concerned with, they, they ask for us right away. <laughs> wow. So the other thing that I wanted to ask about is um, the process of incorporating art into activism. Um, how do you feel that doing that is different from other types of activism in, in its effectiveness? Do you feel that our artistic experience allows for a more intimate connection in the process of creating awareness, which is ultimately what, you, what you're trying to do? Yeah. Well, the simple answer is yes. Um, I think it, it is different in its effectiveness. I think if you really want to connect with people, um, art naturally has to be at the center, you know, because not everyone um, is going to read legislation or policy or even care about those things. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be able to bring things down um, to the average person's level and so that they can understand why this is important to their life. And I think that art is one of those kind of universal languages that um, can translate really um, complex um, ideas and concepts um, and, you know, make them relevant. Mm -hmm. um, I just realized we're not bringing up the pictures. I forgot. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, Kyle, but can you go to the, um, the third image? So what I... What I would say to answer the second part of the question is that, um, yes, um, there is a, a more, there's a different dynamic when um, and an intimate connection, as you said, um, using art. And for me, that has really been um, demonstrated through the baby doll character. Mm -hmm. um, because, because I've been um, attached to Wamandra for so long, you know, um, it's very hard for me to sometimes separate my own identity from the organization because a lot of my my vision um, is executed through the organization. But the baby doll has always been a site where I can just be myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not representing the organization. And I can really use my own voice to talk about things that are important to me and in the way that I want to tell a story, you know? Can you tell us a little bit um, what baby doll is and how it sure. how it became yes of course so the baby doll is what we call a traditional mass character um that emerged um i would assume well i, I don't know really when it would have emerged but it became popular um when the when we were occupied by american soldiers they had a base here in trinidad and um you know they would have had relationships with local women and then gone away on their ships but also leaving behind babies and so the baby doll um is a character that is a young girl or a young woman who is pregnant or has a baby or both um and is looking for her child father um and a lot of the babies were white one again because of the reference to american soldiers um but also because they just win black babies <laughs> right even now in 2020 it's hard to find a black doll um yes it is so yeah um and so the baby doll would go on the street you know during carnival um and single out men and and you know ask you know basically accuse them of being um the baby daddy so they would you know if a man is standing with his wife you know she would say oh you don't remember me <laughs> 11 months ago and he was um jumping through my window you're pretending like you don't remember me because your wife is next to you you know um and really calling out men and demanding that they be responsible for their children and then also asking for money so they typically say you know where the money for the child milk don't you know that milk is expensive? Mm -hmm. um, and so really at the heart of the character, um, it is a feminist character and it's, it's, it's connected to so many um, feminist in issues or woman-centered issues, including you know, responsible fatherhood, 
um, teenage pregnancy, etc. And um, so I just want to talk a little bit about some of the themes I've explored. Um, and the center image that you see there um, is from a play, Jean and Dinah, um, which is a, a Tony Hall play who recently passed. Um, but Jean and Dinah are um, very iconic characters in the Trinidad landscape. Um, they were well-known prostitutes and um, also best friends. And so I had the pleasure of playing um, Jean in Jean and Dinah. Um, and the character, Baby Doll, the Baby Doll character was used um, for Jean to actually talk about her sexual assault, mm -hmm. um, which probably happened when she was a girl, you know? And I think that the character um, does that really well. It can transform you and take you into a different um, headspace um, mm -hmm. and really um, explore things that are, that are difficult to do. Um, but using a familiar and traditional art form to connect with with a local audience. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also think it's fascinating how um, carnival and um, cultural experiences like that allow for a safe safe space for this kind of um, uh, performative um things to develop and 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 feel okay and allow people to relate in a to relate in a very direct way exactly mm -hmm. so one year I, I actually played a a lesbian baby doll mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's one of the ways that i use my activism to push back against you know heteronormativity um and as you said inhabit a safe space to push boundaries um mm -hmm. so my character's name was Leslie. So I was Leslie, the lesbian doll. <laughs> and I was, uh, instead of looking for my, my child father, I was looking for my child mother, um, who was Nikki, who had, who had left me because, um, you know, she couldn't deal with the stigma and discrimination from being with a woman. And it, it was really interesting because I got to explore, you know, complex themes, like what really makes a family? Like, is it just biology or are there other ways in which we can envision um, family. Absolutely. You know, and also it's such a sensitive subject and it, uh, I think that everybody can relate to it, particularly in the Caribbean, where even right now in the Dominican Republic, as we speak, we are in Congress trying to figure out if it's okay to have a childhood marriage. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a thing that that is is being discussed yeah well only very recently was child marriage outlawed in trinidad so trinidad mm -hmm. and Tobago. so it's um it is an ongoing conversation but i feel confident that um that all countries will make the right decision i hope so yeah um there's also a few other performative um projects that you've had, um, Silent Silhouettes and Black Lives Matter. Do you want to yes. talk a little bit about those two? Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, let's get the picture up, Kyle. Kyle is our tech support. <laughs> um, well, Silent Silhouettes is one of my earliest projects that I started in, um, I believe, 2008. Um, so, I would have been introduced to the project um, through a workshop um, and its original name was Silent Witnesses. And so when I, I came back to Trinidad, I thought, how can I rethink this a little bit and make it my own? Um, but basically Silent Silhouettes is a moving installation that um, documents femicide. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, femicide is the murder of women and girls based on their gender identity. So because they are women and girls and the power dynamics um, that that inherently means in a patriarchal society. So in the center there, you see uh, Michelle Isaba, I had mentioned her earlier, who um, did the performance for Mantra. So this is her again. So you can see she's one of our loyal supporters um, is surrounded by the silhouettes and she has flowers in her hand so the very first year that we did this installation 
um, in addition to the installation, it was a performance where she delivered these um, flowers to each of the silhouettes, which was supposed to represent, you know, the love um, that existed in those relationships. Um, but at the end, they're torn and broken and kind of wrapped around the necks of the women. Um, so from very early on, in addition to the visual representation of the silhouette itself, we did um, want to add um, another dimension that really, um, you know, captured the just emotions of grief and terror that accompanies um, the murder, murder of women, but murder of anyone in general, because, you know, we become desensitized to these things um, in the media because every day there's reports of murder. And so the reason, that's one of the reasons why we do this installation every year is to be a solemn reminder that this is happening. These were real women and that their lives mattered. And it's a huge difference to, I mean, in the, in the sense of getting desensitized, I think it's very different to read something in the press than to actually experience it in the physical space. And that's where I feel that it's so potent that exactly. you are using performance and incorporating these images in, in, in the landscape as a reminder. Yeah, so you can see all of them in the top right that they're in a line. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really, a, as you said, an important visual because um, the installation is um, statistically accurate. So Womantra collects the statistics from the police um, as well as from journalists so that we can um, create a story of each woman. Um, mm -hmm. And then we make the number of silhouettes, um, you know, based on the number of women and girls that were killed. So as of November, that number was 18 and it's, it's more now. Mm -hmm. But we use the, de the details that we gather from journalists also to create um, graphic campaigns. So in the top left, you can see there's a woman um, in pink and you can't really see the text behind her, but those are the actual details of her story. Mm -hmm. So we have, over the years, we've been thinking through, you know, what is the ethical implications um, around keeping these women's identities, um, you know, well, not private because it's already in the public domain, but not necessarily um, including it in our installation. So in mm -hmm. earlier years, you can see that our silhouette was very generic. There's mm -hmm. a bearing on it, but it's generic and we used it for each woman. But mm -hmm. now um, you see we've moved into more um, human-like forms. Mm -hmm. um, and each image actually is supposed to be, um, is, is supposed to resemble the actual woman. So based on the details that we have from the news reports, we're now trying to um, create the likeness as close as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And when these um, performances happen, do you invite people to come over? Do people just show up while it's happening? How does it work? Right. So typically the installation happens in a public space, um, like a, a park or something like that, where there's a lot of traffic. Um, and so there may be some um, promotion online, but really it's about getting off of the online space and just going in a public area for whoever passes by. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been really, that has gone really well for us because a lot of people stop and they want to talk with us. They want to debrief. Some mm -hmm. of them can identify the woman based on her story. Um, and they typically ask for resources. So we really use it as an opportunity to raise awareness, but to also um, do outreach. Mm -hmm. um, but this year, we received funding to do an installation, but of course that couldn't happen because of COVID-19. So we decided to make a short film. <laughs> ah, <laughs> and, wonderful. Uh, yeah, and that was a, a really big success because you know people obviously could not visit the installation, but you know we still did it. We captured it in the film, but the film was so much more than the installation. Um, even though it brought the installation to life in a way that um, we hadn't before, 
you know, and we were able to use this perfect song by a local artist, Sheldon Blackman, which pulled at everybody's heartstrings. By the time the movie ended, everybody was crying. Wow, do you have a link for that? That would be, it would be wonderful to share. Yes, of course. Um, you can find it on our Facebook page, um, as well as our YouTube channel. Okay. It's called Silent Silhouettes. Okay, Simple perfect. Title. <laughs> perfect. And, yeah, and, and, and what about Black Lives Matter? Because I know that you went uh, into that kind of activism that was so prevalent this year all over the world. How yeah. did that happen? Girl, it was a journey. <laughs> but <clears throat> can we have the next image? Yes, thank you, Kyle. Um, so some folks who we knew had um, a Black Lives Matter you know, action, so large action in front of the American embassy. And Womantra decided to go. Um, but it seemed to be kind of centered on the American situation with George Floyd and, you know, Breonna Taylor and stuff. Um, but we felt that it was important for us to talk about our own experiences. So, um, you know, members of my team at Womantra started to do research about um, extrajudicial killings here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we started to document the names of all of the people that the police had killed. <clears throat> and we took those to the protest. Um, and so I think we were already kind of in that, that headspace, you know, when just a few days later, um, the police murdered three men um, from a community called Mova, which you mm. can see there in the images. Um, and, you know, they... The authorities were again trying to feed us the narrative that, you know, these criminals, these criminal elements were shooting at them and they were just retaliating. But on this particular occasion, we had evidence that that was a lie because there was CCTV camera footage as well as footage from one of the neighbors. And so there was, you know, obviously um, public outrage and that led to three days of, of protests in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. And I really want to talk about, you know, all of these images because I think all of them were, were so important in different ways. So when this initially happened, um, a local artist, graphic artist, well, he's multimedia artist, Darren Chiwa, um, made the first graphic, which is Mova Black Lives Matter. And as you can see, the T the T T is in red for Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw this image online, and I was like, "This is this is really powerful." You know, we should do more of these. Um, and little did I know how important that was going to be, because <clears throat> when these protests um, started happening, members of our team at Womancho were just. It felt like we were awake for the entire three days, <laughs> just. Um, you know, listening to the news, watching all of the lives um, and listening to what the politicians had to say and stuff. And we actually started to map all of the places where the protests were happening. Mm -hmm. and so we asked Darren if he could make more of these images to represent all of the places where protests were happening. And that became very important because, um, you know, the commissioner of police um, as well as the Minister of National Security was was saying that um, you know this this was organized by you know some gang members who were paying people to protest <laughs> um, in an attempt to destabilize the country. That that was the um, the narrative being pushed, and we were able to show through this exercise of mapping all of the areas where it was happening that that was a lie. Um, and it, it represents a really important counter narrative to what the state was saying, because there were protests happening all the way in South Trinidad, in Central Trinidad, in North Trinidad, you know, mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> that that was one thing that we did. And these important collaborations are important and not just the collaborations, but also being able to see a moment or an opportunity and really exactly. build up. Exactly. And not only that, but this can be a worldwide um, project because this is an image that can be transferable to every country in the world with different names and it will work. Yeah. So just putting that in, into perspective, it, it, it's really powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another thing that we did is you can see a living right there in one of the images. 
Um, and these were apparently some of the last words of Joel Jacobs, which was one of the three men gunned down by the police in Mova. And why this was particularly heartbreaking was because it was his birthday. And he was just with a couple of his friends and they were about to go down on the main road to buy some rum <laughs> to celebrate his birthday. And he literally lived right there. He was just a few steps away from his home. Um, and so we really wanted to, to capture that. Like you can just literally be outside of your home and be gunned down by the police. Um, which was also the, uh, the case of, of Onella Graves who you can see in another image there. Um, so all of these images in the center, the brown ones you can see say one month. So this was after, you know, the three men were killed. So you can see their three names on, well, you probably can't see, on the placards in the first one. In the middle one, it says one month since the three day uprisings. And what we did here is we actually realized that these protests started happening on <clears throat> the birthday of Kwame Ture. Um, and for our audience or those who aren't familiar, Kwame Ture is a Trinidadian or was a Trinidadian black revolutionary and head of the Black Panther Party. And is really important to us as decolonial feminists and Trinidadian feminists. And um, we thought that this is too poetic. <laughs> we have to make these connections. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it was really important for us to find ways to really ground this movement in our own context, you know? Mm -hmm. um, because there's there's so much um, uh, media attention and just global um, attention to the American Black Lives Matter movement, but this is really a global movement and we have to reinforce at every point that we can that black people are being oppressed all around the world. Yeah. Regardless if it's a black majority country, if it's a black government, it really doesn't matter, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah. No, and that brings me to another um, question about how in your experience has feminism evolved from the from a more western and perhaps the dogmatic way that we all know uh, from the past to a more inclusive transmutable energy that can fit into our post-colonial caribbean reality and the challenges that we face now yeah um well i think young people are really leading the way mm -hmm. <laughs> um you know, when I look at, at younger feminists who are 18, 19, 20, um, they really are quite radical and it makes my heart smile, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that that they know what it's about. They are, they, they, they're not um, trapped by the same kind of, you know, respectability and ideas um, about, or disillusioned. <laughs> um as much as as older generations sorry mm -hmm. my earbud fell out give me one second sure i think it's missing but i can still hear you so that's what's important <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah um and so i think that you know being around younger feminists has been really important for me and has been a major part of my work because they they push me in my own boundaries you know yeah. so even when you know people in my my own organization are telling me oh well that's not how we should do this we should think about this differently i always thank them even if i don't agree and even if it irritates me mm -hmm. <laughs> i still thank them because they really force me to think about things in different ways and to be accountable um yeah so i i think that that Caribbean feminism has really proven itself to be diverse um, and decolonial um, and making space for different types of identities and realities. You know, we have mm -hmm. um, an Indo-feminist movement here in the Caribbean. Um, you know, we have a certain type of respect and acknowledgement of indigenous contributions. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 it's very intersectional. And I think also we have to acknowledge our foremothers who were really some of the first women to be talking about intersectionality, even if they didn't use that word. Mm -hmm. you know, so we have Claudia Jones, 
who was um, a very um, uh, well-known <laughs> um, feminist Marxist from Trinidad and Tobago who was talking about triple oppression, you know, race, gender, and class. And then mm -hmm. we have the, you know, the diaspora feminist Audre Lorde, <laughs> mm -hmm. Grenadian and Barbadian, um, you know, who was, you know, talking about intersectionality as well in, 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 um, <clears throat> in ways that really resonate with uh, Black and Caribbean feminists mm -hmm. um, now and all over the, the world. Yeah, and I, I think that's the beauty of finding our own strength in, in being smaller, in being uh, a community as we are in the Caribbean, because it allows for that. We need to connect to other um, um, uh, activists and, and play together and express our thoughts together and make our, our political movements together, because that's, that's sort of like the holistic way of... Um, putting out our views and empowering each other. So I think that's that's uh, an asset that we have and we need to embrace. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, I have another question about, um, I, it, it struck me when you talked about how uh, earlier that people keep calling you for backup and, you know, <laughs> for um, advice and just um, reporting certain things. And I just wanted to know how you feel um, because we come from countries where not trusting our authorities has become the norm. And we have to kind of rely on institutions like you to give us a sense of security. So yeah. we feel vulnerable, insecure, and. And how do you manage that uh, from a mantra to respond to the increasing reliance of people in your platform as a mechanism to to report violence and abuse? Yeah. Um, I think maybe a few years ago, um, a mantra started to do um, kind of informal referrals because women or people in general would reach out to us, you know, regularly to us um, about LGBT friendly doctors or how can I access abortion or, you know, how can I get psychosocial support? Um, and I think, you know, we felt that sense of responsibility of having to become more formalized in the kind of um, support that we, we give to our constituency. Um, and so I am I'm happy to announce <laughs> that in the new year, Womantra will in fact be opening its doors for a legal clinic, uh, which will be supporting victims of gender-based violence. Um, and so, you know, women and men um, can access free advice and uh, representation, you know, if they meet a certain criteria. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, as you said, that people have come to rely on us in a particular type of way is really interesting and it is representative of the failure of the state. Um, and. NGOs really need to be supported because they are offering services that the government can't for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, I think this whole phenomenon about asking where's Romandra is really just a kind of national cry <laughs> that they they literally have no faith that, that the government or the state is going to do what it's supposed to do because it's really not... Um, it doesn't really make sense to call on a on an NGO when a woman is is killed. You know, like how are we supposed to prevent murder? You know, we do what we can, but we are not the police. We're not investigators. Right. <laughs> right. You know. Um. So it's it's a it's a very interesting situation, but we, mm -hmm. we appreciate that we're in a unique position that people um, look to us for advice and for support. And so we are happy to fill that gap to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. And do police find that, that you are an
Can you just please repeat that, Raquel? Yes, I, I'm, I'm asking if the police or the authorities in, in Trinidad, do they consider you to be an ally in terms of the support that you give to the community? I mean, do you, are you, do you ever find yourself in the situation of getting a phone call that you need to forward to them and how do they respond to that? Yeah, well, it's mixed reviews. <laughs> I think that uh, the police is happy, you know, when you're praising them and when you're not praising them, it's, you know, a different story. Yeah. Um, but Womandra is fiercely committed to holding state institutions accountable and we are we are accountable to our constituents to our members um and to women i mean we're woman <laughs> exactly so our um our uh you know our commitment and our loyalty is always going to be to women um and to girls and so i think that the relationship is kind of touch and go and that's why they need to have proper formalized mechanisms in place so that it's not just like, oh, well, I don't like what Womandra said today, so therefore we're not going to give them information tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there needs to be a proper structured way um, in which NGOs and state institutions, not just the police, uh, but all state institutions can share information and have partnerships. You know, even if you don't consider, you know, them an ally. The point is we have common ground um, and we're working towards the same aims, which mm -hmm. should make us allies. Um, mm -hmm. But these relationships are complicated and yes. require negotiation, you know? I can imagine. Mm -hmm. All right, so I wonder if there are, because I, I believe we're in that time where we can start um, receiving <laughs> questions from the public. So are there any questions that maybe Stephanie can answer? Annalie is asking, thanks for sharing, Stephanie. Under COVID, violence against women has risen exponentially. How has it impacted Omantra's work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it has caused gender-based violence to, to rise exponentially. Um, and so part of what we did um, is to create a, a survivor handbook, um, which is, if I might say so myself, really one of the most impressive <laughs> survivor guides that I've seen because it's so comprehensive. Um, <clears throat> it outlines um, all of the resources that are available for victims of gender-based violence so not just the hotline numbers, um, but also organizations that offer support, um, the specific types of police units that exist, how you can get in touch with them, but also the COVID-19 measures um, introduced by the court, for example. So now you can get an emergency protection order that a magistrate can prepare for you. There's a special hotline number for the courts, etc. We also offered uh information in spanish um for the migrant community because we have a large venezuelan migrant community here now in trinidad um so that they can also access these things because we've seen at least four um women i think cuba and venezuelan women being murdered within the past year um but also a specific rights section so how can people navigate the legal system particularly when dealing with police so telling people they have a right to be accompanied at the police station, for example, because, you know, a victim can obviously be traumatized after an incident of violence and want somebody to go with them, you know, and oftentimes the police might be dismissive about that. Um, so you have a right to be accompanied or you have a right to a receipt. So, for example, a lot of times when people go to make a report, um, it's not taken because the police say, oh, well, we don't have any receipt books. That's not an excuse. You know, they can write receipts on a, on a regular piece of paper and just stamp it, for example. You know, um, and I think that the, the police has been able to get away with a lot of things because people don't know what their rights are. And so that was a major part of the, the job of the handbook is to inform people of their rights, but also to inform people about the law. So mm -hmm. it also included 
um, we also did a virtual campaign actually about the domestic violence amendments. Um, so the Domestic Violence Act was amended in June. And so we wanted to bring rights to the people, let people know what these rights are again, because who reads the law? <laughs> and we don't really have a rights centered or educated public. And so I think that has become a major part of Womanja's work is breaking down the law in ways that people can understand. And again, that is relevant to their lives because there's a lot of stuff in there that's really important. Like for mm -hmm. example, now with the new amendments, there's no cap on the amount that a woman can be awarded. So before it was for like $15,000 and now there's no cap, it's within the judgment of the, the magistrate or judge. And these things are important for people to know. And especially if the judiciary is not, you know, fully on top of on top of the law, and this happens, mm -hmm. you know, they might still be working um, on all understandings of the law, um, and so it's really important for our citizenry to know and understand their rights. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, and as I mentioned, the legal clinic, um, which will be opening in January, so and it will be available virtually. So we're really hoping that that can offer some relief. Um, to victims at this time. Okay. I think we have two more questions. Um, Midas is asking, how do you transition between theater, art installation, activism, and the digital space? Do you find the shifting difficulty or is it energizing? <laughs> it's definitely energizing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't find uh, transitioning between different methodologies and approaches difficult. Um, I've always been that way. You know, since I was a child, I was involved in dance um, and theater. Um, and so those things I just carried with me, they don't really seem like they're separate things. Um, and, you know, Raquel, we had talked, you know, in our initial conversation a little bit about that, like, how how artists see themselves as artists and how activists see themselves as activists and how mm -hmm. seeing yourself as, as both um, is really difficult. Um, so even though I don't refer to myself as an artist, um, I, I am aware and I appreciate and value how much art is at the center of my activism. And it feels very natural to me, particularly because my, my main, um, I suppose, point of reference um, or practice is writing. So, yeah, inherently oh. that's its, its own art form. <laughs> wow, I did not know that. And we've been speaking <laughs> quite a bit, that's great. <laughs> that kind of puts it all together. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Is there another question? I think there is. Thin vibes. As a hub for Caribbean and diaspora social justice activist, can you talk about Womancha's regional reach? Do you connect with the Anglophone region or also the Spanish, French, and Dutch Caribbean? Yeah, it's a good question. So, yeah, even though Womancha is based in Trinidad, I have always seen it as being an important link um, for feminists and social justice activists in the region. Um, and I have done collaborative work um, with individuals and organizations um, within the Anglophone Caribbean. Connecting with um, Spanish, French, and Dutch speakers is always um, more difficult because of, you know, obviously the language barrier. Unfortunately, I don't speak any other language fluently enough. Um, and I think it is fundamentally one of the major barriers um, for meaningful solidarity and partnership in the region is the fact that we are so disparate, not only with geography and, of course, inflated prices to even fly anywhere, but mm -hmm. also um, through through language. So my, my partnership has been limited, but there is some. So, for example... Uh, Womantra is part of a project called Frontline Alliance, Caribbean Partnership to End Gender-Based Violence, which is being led by Outright Action International. Um, and uh, one of the countries within our partnership is Haiti. 
Um, and so we have some partnerships there. Um, and uh, back in 2015, um, I think it is Womanja would have co-hosted the Caribbean Women's Sexuality and Diversity Conference, which is put on by ECAID. Um, but at that time it was United and Strong. And that was the first CWSDC where we actually had um, Spanish speakers and also Spanish translators. And so I would have been the one to organize the translation. So I guess the simple answer is yes. I try to, you know, um, make connections when I can, but it is difficult, yes. Do you find that, um, like for example, Spanish speaking islands connect more to the Latin American region and maybe other islands that speak English or Dutch connect more to the continent as opposed to the Caribbean itself working <laughs> together? Yeah, definitely. Um, I can't really say I know too much about Cuba and what Cuba is doing in terms of their feminist movement. Um, but definitely the DR is um, heavily aligned with the Latin American countries, um, which makes sense. Um, Haiti seems to be a kind of prominent figure in terms of the funding landscape and the feminist, um, feminist advocacy landscape. Like, you know, these IOs are always trying to include Haiti. Um, and I suppose that's for many reasons, but one of course being their, um, their economic status. Um, but I always wonder like what's going on with the other Francophone <laughs> islands. And, and I always tell funders that, you know, like are there no feminists in Martinique, in Guadeloupe? Like how are we making a larger effort to include those islands? And so I guess that my advocacy is basically at that level. Um, and I have some say somewhere because I am an advisor um, to the Equality Fund, who um, is currently doing a, a Caribbean project called Women's Voice and Leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think the Dutch islands also um, are, are probably more in conversation with each other than they are <laughs> with the Anglophone Caribbean, um, mm -hmm. one exception being St. Martin. I think St. Martin is, is the most kind of integrated um, with, with the rest of us and perhaps that's because a lot of people in St. Martin speak English and also it's a it's a highly multi-ethnic country but maybe those aren't the reasons at all I don't know mm -hmm. okay I, I have one last question um, mm -hmm. what would your advice be to um, not only younger feminists in the Caribbean region but also people who are being interdisciplinary in their approach to communication through art, activism, um, writing, etc. Yeah, my message. <laughs> this is another common question. Feel pressured. Um, but I guess for me, you know, if I had to, you know, give a message to younger feminists, it would be to, you know, never be afraid of the power of your own voice um you know there'll be a lot of naysayers or people who just don't have the same ideas or priorities as you um but your voice your point of view is important even if it's only important to you and that matters <laughs> but i assure you you'll always find commonalities and so don't be afraid to to share your voice but also um, equally as important is to always question your own positionality. You know, um, none of us have reached, none of us have made it. Our life is a, a lifelong learning experience and you have to always leave space for getting it wrong, for learning, for unlearning. Um, and if you really value other people's voice, you will spend as much time listening as you will talking. <laughs> um, yeah, and also just that, you know, to be a, a radical, uh, to identify as a feminist is not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy road. It's not, you know, a popularity contest or red roses. It's really hard and grueling work and um yeah you know you have to be ready to commit <clears throat> to that more or less for the rest of your life 
<laughs> because I don't see the patriarchy falling anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you it's, know, it's, uh, it's a marathon. It's very interesting that recently I, I was at a meeting and they were debating whether feminism was the right term today, that maybe gender equality was more um, <laughs> fitting with the times. And I just had such a big issue with that. Um, yeah. Because it's, I mean, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, well, I mean, gender equality is obviously the more palatable term. You know, um, I think a lot of the <laughs> the discourse around development um, is um, decided by and articulated by development agencies like the UN, like the IDB, etc. And so gender equality has become the kind of acceptable term to talk about equality between men and women. But that's not what feminism is talking about. <laughs> Feminism isn't talking about equality. Feminism mm -hmm. is talking about, um, you know, radical freedom and liberation and, you know, destruction of gender as we know it. <laughs> so that's not really a message um, that that um, is easily digestible. Um, and so, yeah, I think gender equality is the kind of middle road that people have decided is... Um, is More comfortable is reasonable yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right well i guess we have reached um the end of our conversation because we are close to um two o'clock <laughs> but i just want to say that um this has been super honor for mm -hmm. me to get to know what you do as you as i told you i come from a family of um activists and even though my approach as you were speaking earlier, um, it's, it's kind of like the opposite from you. Like I work through art, but I there's some activism there, but I mostly focus on the artwork. But I completely relate and feel because I was raised knowing how much effort it really takes to do what you do and to make the changes that you do. And I always admire that profoundly. So I wanna really, really thank you for the work that you do and for this conversation today thank you to you as well Raquel it's been a real pleasure um, this conversation has been really easy and um, as I said I think they chose to put us together for a reason <laughs> and the work you do is also me so it's also been an honor for me thank you thank you Stephanie um, I would like to um, please remind you to tune in to today again at 4 p.m. Um, for my discussion with Puerto Rican-based artist Awilda Rodriguez-Lora. In closing today's salon, I'd like to express huge thanks to the Catapult partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making this series of salons happen. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Hello.